Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. And by DIA MTS for advanced manufacturing machinery and lightweight components. All right, Mr. Gary Vassalash. How are you? I'm doing okay. Yeah? Yeah. Do you ever have a situation where you're driving somewhere and you see somebody in like a Cadillac or a Lincoln, a rather mature individual that's like driving not greatly and you think to yourself, geez, I wonder how the guys at Cadillac or Lincoln feel about somebody representing their car that way? It's just, it's just it's a little thing that I, I think about sometimes. That, that, you know, you want to you want to build enthusiasm for your brand, and you see this guy just like putzing, and you go like, "Geez." Yeah. Well, be careful because we're starting to resemble. Yeah, I people. understand that, but uh, I try not to think about it. Yeah. So, what do you think we ought to do today's show on? Uh, how about Tesla? Tesla, how about electric cars, too? And especially Tesla. In fact, why don't we get Lindsey Brook from SAE International and Henry Payne from the Detroit News to have a show together talking about Tesla and electric cars. That'd be a, absolutely I'm great. in. Okay. <laughs> I just happen to be sitting here. Yeah, yeah. We're in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, yeah, actually, the idea for doing a show all on Tesla and electric cars came from a viewer who said, hey, Henry's a total gearhead. He's had a Tesla for over a year. Why don't you get him in the studio and talk about what's it been like to own a car, an electric car, for over a year now? And in fact, you're on your second Tesla. Well, I... I, I, I think before we, okay. we, we, we go into this, that for people who have not seen Henry on the show before should understand that, that Henry, in addition to being a guy who writes car reviews and draws editorial cartoons for the Detroit News, is also a race driver yes. of a vehicle that has an internal combustion engine in it. Yeah. And Henry is a huge gearhead when it comes to ICEs. Yeah, I'm a total fossil fuel addict. And <laughs> but you got an electric car. <laughs> right, which is also a fossil fuel addict. Uh, every, time I every time I plug it in, it uh, gets its juice from the coal plants down in uh, Monroe. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all gotta come from the ground in the, in the end. But I, I, um, I, I when, when Tesla showed the Model 3 in 2016 for the first time. I thought, I got to get on board this train. I had driven Model S's and Model X's. I love them. I mean, they're, they're, they're fabulous cars. They're state-of-the-art uh, electronics. They have all the weight in the bottom, low uh, uh, center of gravity, so they handle really well. And uh, so when the Model 3 uh, went up for order, I thought, I want to jump on this train and see what the experience is like. It's the only viable startup company in my lifetime. And it's been a fascinating ride. It took me two years to get the, get the car. I put down my first thousand bucks, got the car in uh, early. Here we got a picture of you. Yeah, I've taken it to the track a number of times. So I got the car in uh, early 2018, or I'm sorry, late 2018, and I've had it for a year. And I, uh, I, I liked it so much and was pushing the envelope so much on the rear wheel drive car that I bought that um, I, 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 at, on my first anniversary, I actually traded in for the performance model uh, because I, I was taking it to the track and I, you know, I wanted to But explain why you didn't buy a, break. why did you not buy a performance model to begin with? Initially, so, and that's, that's a good story in itself. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's a circus living with uh, uh, Tesla. So when I bought the car, uh, put, put in my order in early 2018, so this is almost two years after I made my $1,000 deposit. And the rear-wheel drive uh, car started at $50,000 with a, with a long-range battery. $50,000 car, which is what I could afford. The uh, performance model, uh, big battery, uh, 3.2, 0 to 60, um, you know, I, I salivated over it. It was $65,000, so it was too much for me. So I went with a rear-wheel drive car. One year later, and I'm taking the rear-wheel drive car to the track, and I'm running out of brakes, and I'm thinking, you know, I want more. And I start to go online and look at performance models and see what they're selling for used. And the used prices are 
sort of right in the ballpark of what my rear wheel drive car was initially. I call Tesla and say, you know, what do you, know, what do you, what do you think about a, a used uh, car? And they said, have you checked out the price for a new performance model lately? No, they had cut the price by $15,000 to $50,000, the same price as the rear wheel drive car I'd bought a year ago. So I traded it in and uh, got the upgrades. And How'd you do the trade-in? <clears throat> and so the trade-in was, uh, was similar to any other. Just go to the uh, dealer, except you, went, they went don't the have dealer. dealers, right? I mean, not, not in the I state of Michigan. Cleveland. Right. Because, okay. Yeah. And, and so in the three years since I first ordered the car, uh, there's this ongoing lawsuit, uh, one of the major lawsuits in the country uh, between Tesla and the state of Michigan to, to let Tesla sell in Michigan. Michigan, like 14 other states, outright bans Tesla from selling direct in Michigan. So if you buy a car, you have to go to Cleveland uh, to pick it up if you're in South uh, eastern Michigan. So I go to Cleveland, I swap the car. The, um, um, uh, uh, what, the residual, the residual value on the car was actually very consistent with uh, other luxury cars, which is interesting because Tesla has become a mass manufacturer in the, in the luxury space. It's the best selling, uh, was the best selling luxury car in 2018. It's the best selling uh, luxury car in 2019. In the U.S. market. In the U.S. market. Yeah. So, it, so the, the, um, the uh, devaluation was 25, 30 percent, just like any other ICE car. And so I traded my car in and bought the, uh, bought the uh, performance model for a little bit more, $60,000 uh, all in from mm -hmm. what I bought the rear wheel drive car a year ago. Mm. So, so you get like a Brembo equivalent brake package and right. bigger wheels and tires and what comes with that, that package? Yeah, and the, uh, it, it's, it's something I like about Tesla. Uh, other buyers might not like it, but there's very little change between uh, a, a, a short range, long range and performance model Tesla. I mean, outwardly to look at the car, the only, the only difference between my rear-wheel drive car and the performance model is you see the red uh, Brembo brakes, the, the calipers. So it does indeed have Brembos on it. But big Brembos, uh -huh. yeah. So that, that's different. The, um, you got a lot more battery mm -hmm. capability. Uh, battery's the same size, but they, they uh, unlock a lot more capability. So, it's so what, you, you like the fact that your car is a little bit more stealth? As opposed to having all kinds of wings and spoilers and things like that. Yeah, right? I, yeah, I'm kind of a. I, I like conservative styling. I'm an old Porsche guy. I grew up in a Porsche family. I like I like conservative design. The the other key difference between the rear wheel drive and the performance model is it's all wheel drive, which is fascinating on track because you know you have uh, two electric motors there that are working together and rotating the car and. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a different experience on track, which is what I was looking for. So, Senator, to that point, so I, I was looking at the uh, Tesla website today, and so you could get the Standard Plus, which will take you 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds, which for you would be like... Walking. Yeah. yeah. You, you take a nap. <laughs> Too slow. Okay. Yeah. So then you can get the long-range all-wheel drive, 4.4 seconds. Yeah, it's starting to talk now. Yeah. And then your car, 3.2 seconds. 3.2, which is right down there with so, supercars. So I, I found what was interesting is, is that if you buy the standard plus, your range is only 250 miles. Not that you apparently care about range. Um, the long, this is, this is the thing, long range all wheel drive. So we're not doing a number today, so I'll have you guys guess what the long range all wheel drive Model 3 Tesla's range how, is. How big is the battery, do you know? No, Henry? Okay. Oh, it's a 80 kilowatt. 80 kilowatts, so that should be easily 300 miles. I'd say 260. You get to guess because it's not your car. <laughs> <laughs> it's 325. Very good. Just three miles off. 322. Huh. 322. Oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's and your cars. This, Dr. This is, Data, you've done it again. But, <laughs> but what's astonishing to me is the fact that your car's stated range is 310 miles. Mm hmm. It's a 12-mile difference. That's an, and that's been upgraded. So, you, so one of the great things about living with this car is over the course of the year, I've gotten a 5-mile, five 5% five uh, uh, range and horsepower boost over the air update. Wouldn't that be Which cool? Which is awesome. If you had yeah. a Corvette and you got 5% yeah. five, five horsepower boosts all the time, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. So, um, so the range, yeah, when I, when I bought the car a year ago, was th the range was 310. 
Now it's 322. Um, is that 5%? I don't know if that's 5%. So Henry, you, you've lived with Teslas over the winter in Michigan. Yeah. And this is, those of us that are, we're all journalists and we go to California to drive a lot of these cars and the performance all seems great. And then you think, what's this gonna be like in January through the end of March in Michigan and the upper Midwest? Could Talk about that a little bit, uh, uh, you know, battery range and any trepidations you might have had if you had to drive the car and, and think, either I get home or I turn on my heater, or do, are they both, uh, do they both work for you? Yeah, ba the battery range is, is, uh, is difficult. I mean, that's... In the wintertime? Well, period. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, you, the, the battery range is the big issue with electric cars. This is a fabulous car. But as soon as you get into any battery issue, uh, driving long distances, dealing with climate, uh, you, you run into uncertainty. And, and I think that's a real barrier uh, with electrics versus ICE cars that have such good infrastructure these days. Uh, so uh, I, get, I got the car here in the winter, my first winter with a car, and, um, and I learned that it, it, it gets about 25% battery degradation under 30 degrees. Go under 20 degrees, it's about 50% battery degradation. Wow. So the car, is, the car is actually really smart. The, the, the car knows its deficiencies in the climate. <laughs> and so if you start out to Chicago, say, and you're expecting to get there uh, at, a, at a certain time, the car will say, no, 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 you're not gonna make it. You're gonna have to stop here because you're only gonna get 50% of range in 20 degree weather. And so it, 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 will, it will route you to a supercharger uh, on, on, that, on that range limitation. But, you know, again, if you're, if, if you're somebody who's on the clock, that's gonna be a real problem if all of a sudden you're expecting 100% range and you're only getting 50% range. Well, I've, I've wondered this on a couple recent trips and here's your Model S's kind of in the middle lane on I-94 and the, I'm thinking, why is this guy going so slow? Because traffic's moving along at 80. Yeah. I'm wondering if he isn't on kind of low juice. Yeah, and it's a problem. This is, this is common with all electric cars. Yeah. Uh, every electric car I've, I've been in has had uh, that kind of uh, battery degradation in, in the cold, but, and, and this is a, a, an interesting point, we've, we've been buzzing in the industry lately about Porsche, the Porsche Taycan, which has come in with a 200 mile range battery. And people are shaking their heads and saying, only 200 miles? I mean, how is that competitive against Tesla Model S, which is 370, or the Tesla Model 3, which is 322? And uh, uh, allegedly, Porsche is using a different mark uh, because they're, they, they want to be painstakingly accurate in what they advertise to their customers. And I must say, in testing a Porsche Taycan a month ago, I, I absolutely flogged the thing over um, um, Angela's Crest in, over in north of Los Angeles, famous twisty road. And, and I was one-to-one -one on odometer uh, to, to a battery range. So... Or being more realistic, maybe. Right. Whereas if you if you flogged the Tesla like that, uh, I, I would lose 25, 30 percent of range. Wow. But but hold on a minute, because <clears throat> Porsche got the 201 miles range on the EPA test. Right. But I'm just saying when when I when I and, and that's why again using the Tesla as a as a benchmark. So I've been, I've been driving a lot of other electric cars in this year that I've had the car. And the, the Porsche was the first car. I've had two exceptions to the, the, to the climate and hard driving rule. Every Jaguar I-Pace, uh, I um, Hyundai Kona, everything I've driven has lost 25% of range in cold weather and, and, and loses a similar amount when you're driving it really hard or going 80 miles an, an hour on the interstate. Hard accelerations. Yeah. Right, all, all that sort of thing. The exceptions have been the Porsche Taycan and the Kia Nero EV. And the, and the Porsche's exception, because I was in California, so the climate was nice, I couldn't test the climate fit. But dri driving the thing flat out um, over twisty roads didn't miss a beat in terms of, in terms of range. It still got the expected range. Is, is it possible though that the vehicle is engineered and set up for driving like that? whereas the other vehicles are not, and, and consequently they're able to give the number, just this is what the range is because we know it, people who aren't Henry, the way they drive cars. That's the way Porsche people drive. That, like Henry. That, that could be. Yeah, but I mean, but, but, yeah. but, you know, 
Hyundai people don't drive like that. That's right. Okay, so. Yeah, I think that's what's that, that's that's an interesting question to ask a Porsche person. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about the Porsche, and uh, you and you learn this with the Tesla, is that any if you uh, you go over seventy miles per per hour on the interstate, and you start to drink uh, battery range. And the Porsche has a setting; they have a they have an EV setting that that limits you to seventy miles an hour. That, that's a choice. They have a multiple drive modes, like all Porsches. One of their drive modes is uh, uh, range saver, and it will not let you go over 70 miles an hour, which I've learned is the magic number uh, when you're tra traveling on the interstate. Interesting. So go back to Angela's Crest. You said you got the same mileage. Now, remember, you charged up the side of the mountain. I've driven that road. It's a fabulous drive. Yeah, yeah. You came back down again, too, and it's probably regenning all the way. That's a very good point, yeah. So, so without that, it's entirely likely I would have drunk range. But you're, right. you're exactly right. And, and, and uh, in talking to the Porsche people afterwards, they did say that had to be a big factor. I drove hard going up, but coming down, I'm regenning. Right. And that's, and that's unique to electric cars. Right. I mean, the, the, the That's Tesla, one of the beauties of them. That's yeah. right. I mean, the Tesla, I have my Tesla set uh, on, on um, extreme uh, regen mode. So I'm let one pedal driving all the time. I mean, uh, you, you so explain to people who have never driven an electric car what that is. Yeah. So uh, uh, and, and and every electric car has a variation of it, um, but but you uh, when you, when you every time you lift your foot off the accelerator, uh, the, the the you get resistance back into the battery, and and, and uh, which it, I'm, I'm not an engineer and can't explain it properly. John probably well, knows the well. I'll just the terminology you know, better briefly, and and you know the the experts are going to sneer at my explanation, but essentially. You step on the throttle, juice goes out of the battery into the electric motor. When you take your foot off and the car is moving, now that electric motor becomes a generator and puts electricity back into the battery. Exactly. And, and so you don't need to use the brake pedal. Right, because you, you, the, because the, the, the electric motor- so good. Yeah, the electric mm -hmm. motor brakes. And, and uh, Chevy uses a pedal where you can get, uh, or a, a, a paddle. paddle on its uh, steering wheel where you can increase regen. In the case of Tesla, you go into the big screen and you can set what uh, degree of regen you want, whether you want extreme or lighter. I like extreme and just drive around town one pedaling. I'm never touching the the uh, the brake pedal because every time I back off the accelerator, it'll automatically brake. Henry, right, wanna, right to a stop at a stoplight. Oh, I want to get back to your, your point about you're driving to Chicago and it tells you you're not going to make it. You need to go to the supercharger. Now, that's the case because you put in the nav system that you're going to Chicago. Yeah. Let's, let's say that you just decided, you know what, I'm going to drive to Traverse City and I know how to get to Traverse City and I don't need to use my navigation system. What then? I mean, the car doesn't know you're going, right? So you've got to keep an eye on it. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and that's a problem. And, and, and uh, the biggest surprise to me in owning this car, I got used to the climate issues, uh, but I was coming back from up north. Uh, this summer in, in pouring rain. I drove in pouring rain for uh, five hours. And I, I, I uh, and there, so there's no change in climate. It was 70 degrees consistently all the way through. But uh, abnormally, it was raining really hard. And so I, I started with a full battery when I left Traverse City area. Uh, and I should have been able to get to uh, home on one charge. It's about 250 miles. So uh, I, I should have been able to get home to Bloomfield Hills, uh, no problem, one charge. Uh, I, I'm going down the road and uh, uh, past Gaylord, uh, down 75, and I'm realizing that the car is using an incredible amount of juice, and I'm, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to get here um, on on one charge, and I and and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm turning things off in the car, turning off, uh, but there's nothing to turn off. It's 70 degrees. It's a, it's a perfect day. I mean, you know, the car was But it's raining. But it's raining outside. And so the, yeah, only, the only thing I, it, so I, I lost 40% of range Wow. in the rain. And you think uh, it's the wipers? No, it's because the wipers run on a 12 volt battery. I mean, there's a, there's a, yeah. there's a 12 volt battery in the car in addition to the big 80 kilowatt hour battery. Um, that, that takes care of things like wipers and, and uh, lights and that kind of thing. and lights and whatnot. I mean, climate. Yeah. The, the climate of the car is dependent on the big battery. But the, 
the small mechanical stuff all runs through the 12 volt. So I know that's not an issue. And I've talked to engineers and, and uh, you know, maybe an engineer will call into this show one time with a solution, but uh, folks scratch their head as to why. Resistance from the water? Well, and, and that is, you know, the, the, that is the one thing I've gotten from engineers is, is that uh, air, aerodynamics is horrible in the rain. You, you, the the, uh, the swirl and yeah, the, turbulence? It, well, just the, the tires are, try, are squeezing out uh, rain, and so, so uh, tire aerodynamics is, is horrible. So they say typically 15% maybe in a mm. gas-fired car uh, you'll lose, but 40% in an electric car and I've heard, I've called Tesla, Tesla won't respond, but uh, you know, speculation that the electric motors are just working really hard um, because they're trying to manage. There's some slippage at, at each wheel. Slippage yeah, yeah. and everything. And, but I was so concerned about it. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm coming down the interstate and to Gary's point, I, I, I realize I'm, I'm not gonna make it home. I'm gonna have to stop in Pontiac, uh, not Pontiac, in um, uh, Glen? Uh, yeah, it's north of Pontiac, um, uh, and uh, because there's a supercharger up there, and, and you kind of, you know, the nice thing about Tesla is it has a supercharger network, unlike every other electric car yeah, in the market. Big advantage. So, so presumably you had to put it in your, or it, was it on the nav screen, or I mean, how did you know where that was? Oh yeah, so I, so yeah, that, that's all on the nav screen. So the infrastructure is is very easy to access in the screen. Uh, that's that's programmed into the car. So I I just you know I'm not going to make it home. I know where the supercharger is, and so I navigated there, and uh, mm. you know and and uh, you know top top got the charge I needed to go. But I was so concerned about this 40% loss that the next day I went out and drove the car just to see if something was wrong. <laughs> Everything was fine, back to normal. So I, so you know you run in that's the thing you run into EVs you run into these weird anomalies yeah I never heard of that yeah, before climate and rain and hey look we got a whole lot more to talk about uh, not just Tesla we'll get into other EV stuff too but first a quick commercial break to the sponsors that make the show possible we're going to give a shout out to Lear and Borg Warner. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back with Lindsey Brook and Henry Payne talking all about the pain in his car driving in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fa you know, just a uh, yeah, fascinating experience to drive this thing over a year. I put 5,000 5, miles on it. I'll, I'll tell you, the, the, um, the other advantage in trading in uh, for a rear-wheel drive car to a performance car is I, as I go through the dealer process again, you kind of get to see where Tesla is getting better. And one of the places they're getting better is in manufacturing quality. So the the uh, first car that I got the that was a 2017 or 2018 2018 Model Three. Yeah, and the, the yeah there was there were some irregularities in the car. Nothing bad. I mean, I, I mean fit and finish little fit and stuff finish, that wasn't uh, quite perfect. Right. Yeah. That uh, you know so, uh, some some big gaps in the panels. No sunken hoods. I mean, you, you saw some real nightmares on some of the cars that were delivered, particularly in early 2018. I, uh, the biggest blemish in my car uh, was when you opened the trunk. Uh, they had not painted the right. Um, the, the, the right um, um, side of the trunk uh, that was still raw. So the trunk inner, you're looking at metal? Well, just you're looking at the undercoat. Yeah, there's, there's a white undercoat. And, uh, Lazy robots. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, the, with the, uh, the, the 2019 car that I got, the performance model, it was much tidier. Uh, the, the, um, the, the build quality was, was better, and I've, I've heard that 
generally, anecdotally, that the build quality it's is like anything better else. Better. You keep yeah. doing the same thing again and again, you get a whole lot better at it. Yeah. What about uh, durability, reliability, that sort of thing? No issues there, and, and I and I find that uh, again interesting when you talk to manufacturers, Porsche. Uh, most recently, uh, testing that car, and you and you say, okay, so um, what are the maintenance issues? And they kind of stop and have to think. Um, well, you'll have to change your tires at some point. Brake pads. Yeah, brake pads. You know, so, you know, windshield washer fluid. Yeah, windshield wipe. <laughs> but but there's really no drivetrain discussion. I, I asked the the Porsche folks. I've asked the Tesla folks this. There are fluids. Uh, in the uh, in the in the in the motors, uh, uh, oil and uh, or yeah, there's uh, there's an oil and, and there's coolant, and uh, they're not they're not concerned about those things. So, you know that's that's uh, that's an interesting uh, discussion to have. I, I I get over the air updates constantly. Um, so like, give us some examples. You mentioned the uh, the performance that you got and the the range that you got. Yeah. So I yeah I got to, the major updates have been things like autopilot the car will self drive today still level two self drive capability. So explain but, explain that what 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 will your car do? Uh, on in in, geo, in in a geo fenced environment which is divided highways uh, limited access divided highway. Um, if you pull the stalk twice, the car will go on full self-drive. It'll change it, it'll change lanes for you. Uh, if you if you've set a navigation point, it'll still. But it, essentially, it is a really good adaptive cruise control. Exactly, and for people who know the Cadillac Super Cruise system, it's very similar to Super Cruise, except that it doesn't monitor monitor you. Cru monitor your eyes. Yeah, Super Cruise will actually right. They have uh, um, they have infrared and lasers that monitor, make sure you're staying awake. So the, in the case of the Tesla, it monitors you by, you have to, you have to uh, give the car affirmation every once in a while that you're still there. Do you have to touch the <laughs> you're wheel? You're still on there. The wheel? Yeah, so, so, what, so the, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, notice a, a slight uh, uh, torque in the, in the wheel. What I like is, is they have rollers on the steering wheel for volume mm. and, you, and for, uh, for a, for a mile per hour in the adaptive cruise, and so you'll, I'll just roll the roller up one mile an hour, and down one mile an hour, just to affirm I'm still there. Yeah. Otherwise, the thing will self-drive, and so it's uh, it's it's fascinating to see what a state-of-the-art autonomous vehicle is is like. Um, we're a long way from autonomy. Yeah. Uh, we're automated. As, yeah, as folks will say, yeah. this is very much a level two car. Uh, but I, I uh, so that that was a major upgrade. I've got the, um, I've, I've had the, uh, the the power and range upgrades. I got an upgrade for Spotify, uh, uh, so I can use Spotify in the car. And I I got an upgrade. Uh, I got a minor upgrade last night, um, which will uh, just give you an example here. Automatic wiper improvements. So this car has uh, auto sense wipers, and so this is an update saying our, our auto wiper sensors have gotten much better, and you'll notice it in these conditions. So you so you, so this is every month. I'll, I'll so, get an yeah. update. So how does this? I mean, does this work like okay? If you have an iPhone or something that'll tell you you have so many updates. Um, and then you say, okay, install this, or are you just suddenly uh, look at your phone and say, oh, they just put these things in my car? Yeah, no, you'll, you'll, you'll just like your phone, uh, I'll get an alert over my phone. Uh, it'll, it'll also be there when I get into the car, but I see it on the phone first. It'll say, hey, uh, I've got some updates for you. What time would you, would you like them now? Would you like to schedule them? I generally schedule them for late at night uh, when the car is stationary, and then I wake up the next morning and I go through the list about what's been updated. So very, very phone-like. And, so, and I tell folks that driving this car is a lot like driving a phone. You can talk to it, give it, give it uh, very intuitive commands. It updates like a phone. And, and if let's say you were driving your car. Could you install the updates while you're driving the car? That's a good question. I've never, never tried that. I don't think you can. Mm. I, I think that's why they ask, when would you like to schedule this? Mm -hmm. that, because I know, I, and I don't know where Tesla stands right now, but that was one of the concerns when the industry started talking about over-the-air right. updates. What do, you, if you, what do you do if you're halfway through an update and somebody needs to use their car right now? Well, the, the decision was, 
you just abort what you were updating, go back to what it was and let the person take it right then and there. Mm -hmm. But what Tesla's done with over-the-year updates is extraordinary. Right. You know, they came out with this in, I want to say, what was it, 2011? Yeah, it's industry-leading, no question. And, you know, now uh, the Mach-E from Ford will have Ford's new electronic architecture a year away from now. Right. And the new Corvette has got GM's new architecture, the new Suburban Tahoe, and I think the CT5 I, Cadillac, yeah, I think, I think that's right. got yep. it too. Right. But what I'm getting at is, Tesla's been doing this for a decade, right. and it's taken the rest of the industry this long to catch up to it. And even when they come out with these new systems, they will not have fully caught up. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think that's what's really exciting about having a viable startup in our industry. Is, uh, this, this is a company out of Silicon Valley. Uh, it's, a, it's an American company, but it's from a totally different culture, and they're just looking at the car with fresh eyes. Nobody has done that for decades. Sometimes they get things wrong, sometimes they get things right. But when they do get things right, they, it's they, game changing. Yeah, it's game changing. It really it's began with industry. software and added the mechanical systems, whereas the rest of the industry is starting the other way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Henry, you got to ask. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of people who buy Teslas to drive them, not at racetracks, to basically say, "I got an electric car. I'm very environmentally aware." Right. Um, have you ever tried to drive your car like that? And what has the experience been like? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. It's hard <laughs> because you you have to drive that car like that in long long range, yeah. long distance, distances. I, I give an example. This summer, I went south, and I, I leave uh, cozy Detroit, and it's eighty degree summer days, and I head south to West Virginia, where my family uh, is, my extended family is. And you get into Ohio in August, and it is boiling. It is 95 to 100 degrees. And so, the, so um, I, I um, head down to Ohio. I got to I got to uh, recharge in South Columbus in order to make it to Charleston, West Virginia. I got all that all that's programmed into the car. Heading to this supercharger in South Columbus, and as the weather gets hotter, the rain starts to degrade. And I get down to um, a little south of Finley, Ohio, and I'm going, I'm going 70 miles an hour, which is the magic number. I, I know over 70 you're going to degrade battery, but I'm being a good boy. I'm going 70 miles an hour in the right-hand lane. And uh, the car says, you're going to have to cut your speed to 65 if you're going to make it to South Columbus. Okay. I've cut my speed to 65. You, you got to roll the, the roll knob anyway to let you know that, <laughs> that, that you're still there. That's that explains right. those Teslas I've seen going what I thought was too <laughs> slow. Right. So I roll the knob right. down I'm, and uh, I'm going along and, and uh, I'm watching, the, I'm, I'm watching the, the temperature go to 97, you know, Columbus, Ohio, and the, the uh, range continues to degrade. And I get to uh, just not too far north of Columbus and the car says, you're going to have to reduce your your uh, your uh, speed to 55 if you're going to make it South Columbus. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I can't drive 55 just like the San Diego. <laughs> <Yeah. going. laughs> I happen to know again, and you sort of know the ecosystem when you when you own a Tesla. I know there are five superchargers around Columbus, so I bail, and and rather than drive 55 all the way down to South Columbus, I go to a North Columbus charger, and recharge there and. And, uh, but there is some inconvenience versus just saying, where's the next set of gas stations, right? You have to kind of know where to That's go. Right. That's right. But it's on the nav. It's It'll on, tell you exactly where to go. Right. But, yeah. you know, it's interesting is, is that it's telling you what your speed needs to be. I mean, it's doing the calculations for you. It's a smart car. And, you know, I mean, just, just yeah. think about any other car that, you know, if you're running out of gas, it's not going to tell you, you know, yeah. go 55. Yeah. You know, it's going to say... You know, low bing, fuel, bing, bing, right? Bing, yeah. right. <laughs> or, or, or that a lot of them have how many miles of range you've got left. And I think that's probably calculated on and some sort of average speed in some of these vehicles. But mm -hmm. it's a good point. Yeah. 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 So w w talk about the whole supercharger uh, experience, because th this is one of the great selling aspects of it. But I'm still one who I want to pull into a gas station, put in, you know, whatever I want to put in, 40, 50 bucks of gas, boom, I'm on my way in three minutes. Right. Or five, max, max. That's if I'm standing in line paying at the cashier. Mm -hmm. Is the supercharger experience good enough? 
I, I think that's a real issue, particularly uh, for busy Americans uh, who, who are on schedules. Um, I, every supercharger I've, I've gone into has been located uh, in a Meyer or some other superstore. So they're conveniently located because they know you're going to be spending a uh, half hour to an hour of time there. So I generally go to superchargers. The, the, at, at most, there's uh, the, the typical supercharger will, will have nine, ten banks, stalls. And so at most, I've seen three other cars there. Hmm. As, you start to, as you start to populate this, um, then there's not only a wait for your car to charge, there are also potentially waits for stalls. Uh, there's a, this was a huge problem in California over Thanksgiving, mm. uh, where, you, where you have tens of thousands of Teslas on the road, and people were on the road for Thanksgiving, and they were waiting uh, a long time just to even get to the stall. They get kind of heated. Right. Yeah. So I, I you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a uh, journalist, sort of a virtual, uh, uh, have a virtual profession. So I, I bake this time into my trips. Uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll get dinner or or lunch, or I'll just sit there and write, get things done while the car charges. But I think that's a huge problem for busy people. They don't have, uh, a, you know, a half hour, 40 minutes to uh, to sit uh, uh, in, in order to get somewhere. And Henry, you have an electric vehicle charging stand in your garage, I assume, yep. at home. How much extra was that in, that came from Tesla? Yeah, no, well, so I, I bought the uh, the Tesla charger, which was $500. That's not necessary. You can get, you can get a standard uh, uh, 240 volt uh, uh, system for you know half that price. And you had to have the 240 wired into the connection. Yeah, but that, that's the expense. It was two thousand dollars for me to wire my house because mm. my my um, your garage didn't have 240. Yeah, yeah you, my garage didn't have 240, and and uh, your panel was my and my panel is is down in the basement. So I had to run copper all the way around my house into my mm. garage to to sustain 240 volts, mm. and uh, so that's a two thousand dollar expense. So. You know, I, I, I think um, uh, manufacturers are starting to figure this thing, this out. GM most recently talking about we're really going to make Cadillac our halo electric brand, not Chevy, because people with like who are buying Cadillacs or Teslas have disposable income, uh, so that they can mm -hmm. put up with expenses like this, or frankly, just use this, cars like this as a third car. What I've also heard Tesla owners talk about is don't fully charge it. Just go 80% and yep. drive because that last 20% of charging goes slow. Yep. And, you know, uh, the, the analogy I always heard is charging a battery is like pouring beer into a glass. At first, you can power it real fast, and then as it gets to the top, you got to slow down. Yeah. Right. And a battery works the same way. Have you tried doing that, maybe only going to 80% charge and then driving? Always. Yeah, you <laughs> Every <learn>. day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah you, become, you become a battery expert uh, right. living with these things. Right. And again, I think for the, the average uh, buyer who, look, who looks at their car as an appliance, they, wanna, they don't want to mess with that. They don't want to know. I got to keep it. I mean, it's better for battery longevity too to to, to charge between twenty and eighty percent. So you so you kind of learn these things uh, about the battery. And again, the car is very smart in in suggesting things to you. But uh, it's not just that it fills slower over eighty percent. It's also you get better battery life if you fill eighty eighty percent. So you know, for a motorhead like me, uh, it's it's a fascinating experience. But I think it has a long way to go. To be in every man's car. To, to the point of charging, okay, let's say that you're not near a supercharger and you need charging. Can you go anywhere and charge your car? I can. So that's the benefit of uh, Tesla. I've, I've got all the adapters in the car. So I can go to Electrify America. Uh, you can use their ch superchargers. I can, I can use uh, the Could you use uh, Nissan's Chatamo? Uh, Will it work with that? I don't think I can use. It work with SAE's connectors, but, but SAE, not not the Nissan. Yeah, I, I don't think I can use Chatamo. Okay, I can use all the SAE uh, connectors. Yeah, so I can go anywhere. Whereas uh, folks with electric cars can't use uh, Tesla's chargers; they're exclusive to Tesla. Even if they got an adapter. The charger was smart to go, boy, you're not a Tesla. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I don't recognize you. You know, a, a funny little side story. Uh, SAE put together, uh, I don't know, what is it, a committee or anything like that to come up with uh, charging systems. 
and Tesla participated was in on the all committee. of it. Was on right. the committee. Right. You know, and let them go down the, all the route of the SAE thing. Then that, right after that, they announced Supercharger. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I know this pissed off the EV community. Right. Sure. Because, right. you know, they, they want to grow all electric car sales. And Tesla went off and did its own thing. Yeah. But I'll, I'll give Tesla credit. It's been a major selling point for the car. Yeah. Well, and again, I, I, I got to say, and I, and I, I mean, this is a big company town, but I come from a small town manufacturing family. And, and, and if, you're, if you're, in manufacturing, you're new in manufacturing, you want to do everything you can to get your brand recognized over the establishment players. So I, I think these things, while they're annoying to the establishment industry, they're very smart for Tesla. I mean, that, that brand means the best supercharged supercharger network in America. That's a huge expense to them to put in place, but I think it was essential to establishing themselves uh, as, as a luxury uh, electric brand. You know, to, to that point, I've got to say, uh, anecdotally, okay, over Thanksgiving, family meeting in Philadelphia, so outside the Detroit Echo Chamber, sit down to dinner, maybe 18 people at this giant T-shaped table. As Soon as I sit down, the questions about cars. Uncle Lindsay, have you seen the Cybertruck, the <laughs> Tesla Cybertruck? What do you think of the Tesla Cybertruck? Have you driven the Tesla Cybertruck? By comparison, there was one question about the C8 Corvette, the new Corvette. Hmm. Everybody from maybe seven-year-olds up to 70-year-olds, this was such a buzz. Yep. Whether you like the thing or not, I mean, this is a company. Yeah, we got a picture of it up. This is a screen. company that has serious buzz surrounding it. Yeah, yeah, br brilliant PR. Yeah, and they have Steve Jobs as their CEO. You yeah. know, the <laughs> yeah. Elon Musk, who's very good at about creating personal attention. I, my my funny story about the Cybertruck is that uh, after it was unveiled, and of course we're not going to see the production model for a couple more years. But I went around and polled some of my F one fifty friends in the Detroit area and said would you be interested in this truck? And I was surprised to learn that all of them would be interested. They were all intrigued Wow! that somebody was doing something different than the usual three box truck. But the, the funniest comment I got was from an F-150 guy. And I, and I said, what do you think of the Cybertruck? And he said, uh, oh, you're the one with the broken windows. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I said, that's it. And he said, yeah, I saw that on the, on the news. That was, uh, that was really something. But then I, I uh, learned that they're doing an electric truck, and that was pretty cool. And I said, I said have you heard of Rivian or um, uh, Bollinger. Bollinger. Bollinger or uh, Lordstown Motors? They're also making electric trucks. No, never heard of them. They got to break some windows. Yeah, so the fact that Tesla broke a window and made the, the evening news um, got his attention. And what we're talking about is we're, we're on the cusp of a new decade. This next decade is going to be, I mean, our, this conversation, if we have it in another nine years, is going to be, we will have seen so much change. That's right. But the, the whole issue of pickups and what they mean to American drivers and this economy and this industry, what we're talking about here, this is going to be really exciting to watch. In fact, that, that should be a good segue for the next segment because yeah. we got to take a quick commercial break right here, here and give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone and DIA MTS. Whether they're electric, autonomous, or connected, tomorrow's cars must be developed quickly with the highest precision, and they have to be lightweight. DIA MTS can provide what you need, from advanced manufacturing machinery to lightweight components. Learn more at our website at www.d-iamts.com or visit our showroom right next to Metro Airport in Detroit. All right, we're back talking, I was going to say all things electric. We've been talking a lot about Tesla right now, but Gary, I cut you off just before we well, went Well, I was going to quickly ask, and, and I don't want to dwell on this because I think we got to go into some other car makers, but the F-150 people that you were talking to, do you think they were interested in the Cybertruck because it was a Tesla versus looking at it as what they see their truck as being, presumably a tool, something that they use for their work, for their job? And, and so it's a, it's a different thing. It's something that takes the, the form factor of a 
truck, you know, in air quotes? Well, I, on first blush, I think they were interested because all these guys are wedded to their trucks. You know, you talk to electricians and contractors, which all these guys were, and they actually they absolutely live with their trucks. And so I'm uh, so I was uh, I was initially interested that their reaction to the Tesla truck was much like my reaction to the Model Three. They, they, it was so different than anything they had seen before. It was the truck reimagined. And, you know, the first time I drove a Model S, I thought, holy cow, I mean, this is a 5,000 pound thing that's going around clover leaves like a sports car because the center of gravity was so low. And I, first thing occurred to me was, I want to get this thing on the track. And, uh, and talking to these truck guys, um, and, and they're, they're, they're looking at the shape, which gets their attention. I mean, they're, they're, they're just wowed not to. by how different it is. But they're also thinking, electric. That's a lot of torque. I tow stuff. That's that's an interesting idea. I'm a contractor. Like most contractors, I live within, you know, 50 miles of of all your jobs. of all my jobs. I never have to go to a gas station again. I just do my my thing and I plug in every night. So so immediately they start thinking about how electric benefits them. And 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 I, I, to a, to a truck guy, I thought the most important slide that Musk put up on the screen in the Cybertruck reveal was, your monthly, your monthly cost for a gas truck is 750 a month, your, your, your cost for an electric truck, a Cybertruck, 500 a month. And that, that, those, are, those are big numbers. Did he build the duty cycle into that though? Yeah, I mean, who, yeah, yeah. again, who, you, know, you gotta, you gotta- If every day you're number. pulling five lawnmowers and stuff in the back or right. some sort of load, that changes. That's well, right. and, that, and that's where it gets, it gets tricky as I yeah. talk to these F-150 guys. But if, if, okay, the F-150 guy, somebody drops an electric motor, as Ford will do, into an F-150, okay, so they got that there, and then there's a cyber truck right next to it. Yeah. Which would they choose? That's going to be a good test. The, the, the other thing I think is brilliant that Tesla did was unlike Rivian, uh, which is talking about a $60,000, $70,000 base truck, Bollinger is talking about a $125,000 truck, Te Tesla says, we'll deliver this truck to you between forty dollars and $70,000. That's a price range that all they, they these folks a lot of things, are, Henry. I know, but, yeah. but I'm just saying, this is a price range yeah. they're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. And... So I think you'll get those comparisons. Well, I, according to the Tesla website, it goes uh, zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. You gonna buy one? <laughs> the Cybertruck? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not a truck guy. I'm a track, I'm a track 9 guy. 2.9 seconds, it's faster track. than your car. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's my question to you guys. So I just, I just looked at the numbers. So for the first three quarters of the year, um, Nissan in the United States sold 9,998 Leafs, mm -hmm. and Chevy sold 13,111 Bolts. Okay, this is not exactly setting the world on fire. Right. These are everybody else but Tesla. We're right. So, so let's, about. yeah, let's, let's <laughs> put Tesla to the side. So to put it another way, Tesla has, I got the numbers here, through the year, 77.4% market share. In EVs. In battery EVs. EVs. Oh, I'm just talking battery EVs. So, yeah. okay, so, Lindsay, why is nobody buying these things? Just unfamiliarity, I think. We are so close to this, and we're driving different cars all the time. And there's the question, people forget the beginning of the auto industry. You couldn't find gas on every corner. So where, where I charge, as we've discussed, is one thing. Uh, rumors and, you know, not really sure about range, you know, and is range going to decline in thermal environments and use case in environments? And there aren't a lot of, of nameplates out there yet. I think in the next three years when we see an assault from, you know, Volkswagen, GM, Ford, et cetera. I just think the more visibility is gonna change the discussion that maybe by 20, 25, 26, I think we'll start to see some momentum in this. I think, I think 2020 to 2024, there's still gonna be a lot of new players and uh, all, all these questions. Plus the infrastructure question on, if five people on my block all of a sudden buy EVs, are we gonna be popping the, uh, the circuits all the time? Yeah. So. I think the second half of this decade is the, there will be momentum build up to 2025, and then things are going to start to roll. That's my own view. Or not, because uh, you know, again, you go back to 2000, and uh, and the Toyota Prius hit the scene. First car to go over 100,000 in volume for a hybrid. Everybody thought, ah, here we are, the hybrid yeah. revolution. We're going to be 50% hybrid by 2015. And it turned out to be. 
uh, Prius is to hybrids what Tesla right now is to EVs. Right. Take away Prius from hybrids and there's not a lot of them, or by comparison. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although, Although Bob Carter said that he can't build enough uh, RAV4 hybrids, so. And, yeah. so that, and that's yeah. what's interesting, is now you're, you're getting in, and, and is that government, is that regulatory driven? No, no, or, or not at all. People, people, people like, want people it. People like it, yeah. Right. right. Or, uh, but, but what I'm saying is uh, their, their margins, I mean, you're putting a battery into the car in addition to an IC engine, so you're, you, their, ma their margins have to be shrinking. So they want the volume to meet the regulations. But, um, that, I mean, the RAV4 and, and the Ford Escape, um, and there's one more in that mix, uh, the, the Honda CRV, are all coming in with mainstream hybrids now. And uh, they're not Priuses. Right, they're not. You, you don't instantly identify. Oh, that's a hybrid. As a, as a taxi cab. Yeah, these are these are four hundred thousand vo volume appliances. Yeah. So, so that that's what intrigues me is that now the the manufacturers are learning how to use hybrid where the customer wants it. Mm -hmm. And the 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 thing that intrigues me about the uh, about the the electric battery is that um, uh, not not only for appliances like that, which is a fuel economy play. But you're also seeing this in high-performance luxury plays, where um, where, where uh, supercars are bringing batteries in purely for, for performance. Because I can tell you, when you the, the the Tesla Model 3 is on the whole an inferior car right now to a BMW 3 Series 3 Series on the track, yeah. but there is nothing like electric torque coming off of it off of a corner. I mean, once you do that, once you step on the pedal of a Model 3 coming out of a corner and then do the same thing with the turbocharged four six-cylinder BMW, the BMW is like, what happened to this thing? <laughs> 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 What's this lag? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, so yeah. I, th I think uh, both on the, you know, the, 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 the electrification obviously has benefits for families in the fuel economy play as we're seeing with the RAV4s, but it also is going to have a performance element. So let me ask you guys, we, we don't know this, so this will be pure speculation. How transformative will the Mustang Mach-E be to electric vehicles? Well, I, I think it's, that's going to be really interesting to watch because it's a, it's a Tesla clone. I mean, this thing is a, it's an absolute Tesla clone of the uh, Model Y. And, and then Ford banking on their dealer infrastructure. And, and the nameplate. Uh, and the nameplate, uh, Mustang, is going to be able to sell it versus Tesla, which is such a powerful uh, brand, that segment. Uh, you mentioned the Chevy Bolt numbers. Remember, the Chevy Bolt, to much acclaim, beat the Tesla Model 3 to market in 2000. And, uh, yeah, but it didn't make any difference. Yeah. And made no dent. Even though it's a very, very good car, Made, made no dent in that market. So it would be interesting to see how the Mach-E does. Do, do you think that there'll be uh, a significant change? I mean, uh, obviously there'll be a lot of people, and, and they already have yeah. signed up to buy this thing. Yeah, a couple of things with Mach-E. I think Ford, obviously, as John mentioned, uh, dedicated architecture, okay? So this starts it out. This isn't just, like you said, plopping a motor down into an additional, uh, an existing frame. So that's, that's good for Ford and that gets them on that track. But I think the nameplate thing is a big deal here because there's all these incumbent nameplates that we all rever in the marketplace. F-150, Wrangler, Corvette, et cetera, that can all be become the same thing that this Mach-E is, is an electric version of that nameplate that takes the nameplate into the electrified future. Tesla as a brand is Tesla, and Model 3 is kind of a, a secondary adjunct to that. So mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about kind of icons here that I think, I think the industry is going to have to leverage to get people on, on the plan. And you, if you see Ford's initial kind of visuals of this, they show the existing Shelby Mustang and all the combustion engine Mustangs, and they show this Mach-E. So it starts to get people thinking that this is a logical transition into the electric future. But is, is it... Is it going to be uh, uh, the Mustang as a vehicle is is you know a, a small segment, right? I mean, there were more people who were driving um, Fusions than Mustangs. I mean, right. That's just how it is, right? Right. And so we're going to have people who are going to be Mustang fans who are going to buy the the Mach-E because they have a regular Mustang and then they'll have the Mach-E, right? So at some point, all that's going to go away because those guys are all going to own one. Does the average consumer buy one? Or yeah. does the average consumer go, you know what? Oh, Volkswagen's got that new thing that has that funny name. Mm, what is it? Oh, uh, ID.3. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, but, but I, think, I think what this does is it, it continues brand allegiance. I, I think there'll be new buyers, too, that'll say, yeah, Mustangs, these things have been... The whole thing about young kids is this kind of genuine thing that everybody wants to be. And you know, Is it real? Is it genuine? Mustang's genuine. Corvette's genuine. Wrangler's genuine. 911 Porsche is genuine. You know, these, I, I think this is going to help move people into the electrified future, regardless of volume. Or not. I mean, and again, the, the big, yeah. the, the, you know, the folks in this town love to predict the future. Nobody predicted two, two and a half gallon, dollar gallon gas. Nobody predicted the... Uh, Spanish acquisition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody predicted that the United States would be, be the biggest oil producer in the world. The rise in shale oil has been a huge knuckleball that nobody saw coming. He, he, right. here's, here's the problem for the industry as I see it. And that's, that's a great question about the Mach-E. It, it's the first real competition that Tesla is facing from a, uh, a mass market yeah. automaker. You know, it's it's got the Mustang nameplate to it. It's got the big screen that dominates the interior. It's got over-the-air updates. You know, like you say, it's a it's a Tesla clone. So this is the first shot at it. It also starts at forty-five thousand dollars. That takes it ten grand above where the average market price is right now. Right. And Ford's got to charge that because I believe you have to charge o at right now over forty thousand dollars to be able to make a profit on an electric car. Leaf, how much money did Nissan lose on the Leaf? Five billion dollars? Yeah. Six billion dollars? It's been a total disaster from an investment standpoint. I'd love to know how much money Chevrolet or G GM lost on the bolt. They never made a nickel on right. it. So before EVs can go mass market, the price has got to come down. Uh, I was at the SAE uh, International Powertrain Conference. I talked to the largest battery maker in China. They say that they'll be at $100 per kilowatt hour at the cell level in 2022. Hmm. So that probably means the... The, the pack is around 130, 140 bucks. Okay, so another mass market manufacturer at the same conference said, we need $85 per kilowatt hour to be able to make a profit on an electric car. So there's a huge gap. Between 85 and 100. And 135. Right. Even, you know, because some people like to quote the price of the cell. Well, you, you gotta quote the whole pack. Yeah. And, you know, all the motors and the coolant and, you know, the, the, the tray and uh, yeah. the connector, all that stuff builds it back up. So th that tells me the EVs are not going to go mass market. So what does scale do? That's one of the questions here. Scale is good, yeah. obviously. But then, you know, you got to stuff the stuff full of lithium and you got to stuff it through a, a full of uh, cobalt, you know. For, and so you now get into this materials uh, issue where it's, it's like putting more steel on a car. OK, right. maybe you get a discount on the steel, but you're paying more for the steel. Right. So same if you're going to put in bigger batteries, you're going to pay more for the lithium and the cobalt. That's, there's just no two ways around it. But what about these externalities, i.e. government regulation? And we're seeing it now with the EU looking at possibly tariffs, you know, for them, they're not meeting their own targets, you know. And so are they going to leverage kind of trade with North America so that what we deliver to them is going to be to their standard? What do you, I mean, is this in terms of like if we sent normal Mustangs over versus Mach-E? Well, it's just part of the whole trade complexion is to, the, the world is not on the, same, on the same page. And regulators worldwide are all trying to work at different, different levels of enthusiasm to those lower goals. Mm -hmm. And here the U.S. is kind of out here, uh, you know, an outlier right now. So, so reg, reg, that's where the profits are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, right. and, and regulation is kind of this externality that I think, as we talked earlier, you know, drives some of this this stuff, whether we like it or not. Well, I mean, to that point, I mean, Mercedes has just announced that they're not going to be bringing the EQC, their electric vehicle, to the U.S as early as they'd anticipated because they need that volume for the German market. Right. And I wonder how much of that is predicated on this. Well, well and, and part of, you know, VW and the industry's punishment over there is, is Electrify America and the big EV push over there. And th those social democracies are a little bit different than our economic well, system. I, I, I'm going to ask Henry a question that maybe gets to some of the topic that you brought up there, Lindsay. 
Would you have bought a Tesla without the $7,500 tax credit? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And again, and, and again, that's to, to me, that's that's what separates Tesla from a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt. Well, I was intrigued. I, I liked the car. Yeah. Uh, that's I, a big deal. Right. You know, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, then, and, they, and I think that's been one of the things Tesla's done well is they've broadened the demographic beyond green true believers. That's still the heart of Tesla's market, but they're attracting uh, guys like me. But it's, it's, a, it's a luxury car, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll also say, even with that $7,500 tax break, I talk to my, my car buddies all the time. They, all, they own BMWs and Audis, and yeah. not, nine out of ten of them aren't interested in owning a Tesla. It's just, it does, the, the EV thing, all the little issues we've been talking about here just does not make sense to them. So what, what if there was a spreadsheet, and it had all the specs of your car that you just said that you really like a lot, and the specs were identical for another brand, a more common brand, a brand from a U.S. or Asian or European auto manufacturer. Would you have bought the Tesla because you think Tesla is special? Well, I, I, that was one of the things that attracted me is as a startup, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by that. I applaud that. I mean, seeing a startup in this, in this space so I, 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 they, they were just doing things so differently. And I must say, even been driving this thing for a year, I, dr I drive a lot of cars, as we all do, as uh, auto testers. And every time I get into that car, it feels fresh. Um, it's, it feels Some, like nothing else. It's just been updated. <laughs> yeah, well, that's and, right. And and all somebody's going to be somebody's yeah. going to be thinking. Henry said earlier, I've had this car for a year and I've driven it five thousand miles. They're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How is you know, it's five thousand miles? Yeah. I yeah. drove that last week. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, I think what uh, ten thousand is the average uh, miles a year. So I, yeah. Uh, but again, I, if, I'm an enthusiast. I, I have other cars, so I, I I don't put a lot of miles on any of my cars. So. You know, I'm 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 different in that uh, sense, but uh, but I but I do think for for consumers who were attracted to Tesla, uh, I think there is that different. You know, it's it's different. And, and in talking to the Mustang folks, it was interesting. The exterior designers all knew they had to make the exterior look like a Mustang. You know, there had to be a reflection of the icon there. When it came to the interior, the interior guys were like, "We have to make this thing look modern." Tesla-like. I mean, they knew what they knew what the standard was, and uh, and and that's what's interesting is that, that Tesla has set a new standard in a lot of ways. I, I think what it, what I'm getting at is we've seen the industry when when you make a projection, you think something is going to happen by what year, and there's been so many things that have just changed predictions out there. John's always right. I, 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 well, what the hell? I, and, and, <laughs> but, but, but I think some of the things we've seen, you know, just most recently, you know, the 2.7 liter EcoBoost V6 in F-Series, that within a year, it was like half the volume of the truck. In, in, a, in a tried and true vehicle and marketplace where the V8 engine was just ruled dominant. And there's other examples of, of similar technologies, too, that I, I think once you get kind of maybe not your next door neighbor, but two neighbors down driving something and, and you know, people start to kind of talk. And that's why I'm saying 2026 is we'll start to see some change in this, I, I think. But, but there's also my predict prediction. There, there's also this, though, Lindsay. I mean, the, the uh, speaking of technologies, diesel, diesel was the future in the 1990s. Right. Your, Europe. Europe uh, remade its, its, uh, its, its um, regulatory cost and taxation system in order to benefit a particular technology, diesel, right. in order to get us off of fuel. Today, diesel is the devil. Right. I mean, governments are, you know, yeah. governments are that fickle. It, it turned that quickly, right. although it, it did turn on a company, you know, cheating in compliance. Right. We all, we're all diesel believers here, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and Henry's a big fan of diesels. I remember when he was sitting right there after yeah, the news I, I, broke. I am, I am I love too. diesels. You know, yeah. I've, I've driven, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the, but governments are that fickle. Right. And, um, you know, lithium, we, we are totally foreign dependent on lithium. It's, it's a huge issue. It's coming out of places like Bolivia that, that, right. that have horrific environmental Horrible. practices. Right. You know, what, what if the green right. movement decides they don't like the way lithium is mined? You know, do those fickle governments switch to 
the next shiny thing. It's a, it's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Walking. Uh, that, <laughs> this is, Bicycle. This is when we'll schedule the show for hydrogen fuel cells. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Hey, look, we're going to have to wrap up. Fascinating discussion. A lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Henry, thanks so much. You know, really interesting to be able to talk to a gearhead, you know, who who loves the smell of gasoline that's got an electric car and yeah. loves it. Love the, love the car, yeah. Always great to be on, John. Yeah. He loves that Thank electric you. train set smell when things start to <laughs> yeah. burn up. The smoke coming out. Just kidding. <laughs> the ozone from the electric car. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, just like the train you get when I was a kid. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Lindsay, great having you on the show. Thanks, too. John. Yeah. And Gary, we'll just keep on doing this. Okay. Great. Yeah. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. And by DIA MTS, for advanced manufacturing machinery and lightweight components. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.